Lord Jesus, we will not grow weary of thanking you in all of eternity. Your scars will remain and proclaim the wonderful work that you did to bring us to yourself. We stand here because we have been purchased by your blood and all who belong to you can sing and we can sing for joy and for gratitude because you have rescued us from the wrath we deserve. There's no greater privilege than knowing you. No greater privilege than to follow you in discipleship, walking in your ways, yielding our lives to your care and being your ambassadors on this earth. We pray that we would be so faithfully until you return for us in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning is TES Sunday, and a sermon this morning on training pastors is the topic. And so if you're not a pastor, if you're not training to pastor, uh, you are allowed to tune out. No, you may not tune out, because the training of pastors is the task of the local church, which you are. So you have a hand in this, and so I want you to listen closely. On the platform this morning is uh, a portrait, a painting of Dr. George Zemeck. Dr. George Zemeck is with the Lord, and uh, Karina Downer has painted this for us, and it is going to go on the wall outside of the TES classroom, so that we will no longer call it the TES classroom, it will be called the Zemeck Room. And this is the first portrait of several that will go up around the church. Uh, you've, you've noticed we don't really have good names for our rooms. Uh, we tried numbers a while back and nobody could remember which one was room seven. And so we call it the, this room and then that room, depending on how it's used. And they get used for different things. And so uh, eventually they will be named after church heroes. Heroes from church history. People that have gone before and lived well. Uh, whose memories, whose lives, whose doctrine, whose testimonies teach us how to live. And so though Dr. Zemeck is a, a recent citizen of his permanent residence, uh, he is a church history hero nonetheless, and one who has had a personal hand in the training of pastors for over 50 years. He spent over five decades of his life training pastors. Uh, at the Master's Seminary in several churches, and then finally through the Expositor's Seminary. So he has been a friend and a mentor and an example. He's been particularly an example of a, of a high intellectual capacity with a profound humility and love for God, love for people. And I have had the, the really remarkable experience of trembling while preaching with Dr. Zemeck in a chair down there, wondering what he must think of this really poor exercise and being greeted only with the warmth of one who loved to hear God's word and was eager to be changed by it, no matter the vehicle. And so we're just thankful for Dr. Zemeck, thankful for his ministry and his life echoes through the men who are training for ministry now. Uh, Jeremy, you had him in his last semester, is that right? Yep. And the guys that have followed Jeremy won't get to have Dr. Zemeck in person, uh, but they will have him through the conduit of others who learned from him. And then hopefully that baton will continue to be passed for decades to come. So that's why that's here. It will be on the wall. Uh, if I can, for just a moment, tell you about this for a little bit. It, it's got museum glass on the front of it. So please don't touch it. <laughs> don't get your fingerprints on it. And if you see fingerprints on it, please don't clean it. <laughs> Water, Windex, anything placed on there will ruin the glass. Okay, there's the warning. <laughs> don't touch the glass. Why must a church train pastors. 
How must a church train pastors? Those are some of the questions I want to tackle this morning as we look at God's word together. And, and really, we have to ask, where do shepherds for the church come from? Is there a dollar store for pastors? Is, is there a, an entry at Amazon.com where you can order a pastor and they arrive next day? Where do you get shepherds for the local church? I mean, who wants to do this and how do they get equipped? That is a critical question, and, and often the church has relegated that exercise to institutions outside of the church. And one of the great dangers of relegating that serious responsibility to institutions outside of the church is that often those institutions don't have the heartbeat of what the church is. And it would be like sending a doctor to get trained in book work only to find out he's not good with people, he's not good with his hands. He has a bunch of knowledge up here in the theoretical, but he, it's all abstractions, and he doesn't know what to do with it in real life, and he actually isn't interested in saving lives. But to train pastors in the context of the local church means that pastors in the next generation will love what the church is supposed to be. They will have grown up and benefited from healthy local churches. See, what a tragedy it is when somebody goes from kindergarten to elementary school, and then to middle school and high school, and then undergraduate, and says, you know, the next thing I need to do is get another degree. What should I do with my life? Hmm, theology's fun to play with. Uh, pastors have a great gig. I mean, they only work on Sundays. And what a tragedy it is to just fill a mind with academic jargon in abstractions rather than fill a heart with the gospel and love for God and love of God's people in the context, the environment, the culture of a living, vibrant local church that is doing what a church should be doing. And this is why at the very front, I want you, Grace Bible Church, to not tune out as I talk for the next 45 minutes about training pastors. Because yours is the task of training pastors in significant measure. This classroom at the front of our building will handle a lot of the academics. The, the elders, the pastors of this church will handle apprenticeship and, and discipleship and leadership development. But, but one of the significant aspects of training pastors for ministry in the local church is an active, vibrant, functioning local church that teaches men what to do, how to live, what to aim at. So you're such a big part of this, you need to know. When you think about Grace Bible Church and its history, and you think about the men who have preached and taught and led ministries... I want to particularly highlight some of those names, this isn't exhaustive, but some of those names from whom you've benefited who are not here anymore. Josh Kelso, Tom Engstead, Tyler Azeltine, Scott Maxwell, John Duby, Jeff Maxwell, Omri Miles, Steve Kovac, Kyle Frazee, Matt Dodd, Zach Kahn. Those are heavyweights, servants who handled God's word in the lives of God's people. Where did they come from? And where have they gone? <laughs> Those are two really important questions. We didn't get them from Amazon. They were discipled in local churches. And many of them discipled in this local church. And then they have gone to replicate those same things in other places. Some near and some far. Some 30 minutes up the road. Some on the other side of the world. And lots in between. Where do they come from? Where will we get men like those so that we can send more and benefit here? I want to propose to you from two passages the answer to the question, where do shepherds for the church come from? And the first answer to that question is in Matthew 28. So turn there, if you will. 
Shepherds for the church come from a church that is committed to a culture of discipleship. A culture of discipleship. Uh, What is discipleship? Uh, Discipleship is is a culture of disciples. What are disciples? A disciple is a learner, a student, a follower. A disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is one who says, I want to follow Jesus. Where he put his feet, I want to put my feet. What he was like, that's what I want to be like. When he tells me what to do, that's what I want to do. It is a learner of Jesus. And and the Lord Jesus Christ gave to the church as his plan of getting his gospel to the ends of the earth, an unbreakable chain of this discipleship. Look at Matthew 28. This is called the Great Commission. And for good reason. This is Jesus commissioning the 11 disciples to make disciple-making, disciple-making, disciple-making disciples to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the age. Listen to Jesus' words. Verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I command you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Jesus said he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The church would be the vehicle by which Jesus gets the gospel to the ends of the earth. If you're here this morning and this is completely foreign language, what what is a pastor? What is the church? What is a gospel? Can you start me at the beginning? Let me just explain to you what this is all about. The gospel is good news That God looked down on the world he created, filled with people who sin, like you and me. We sin out of our nature, and we sin with our thoughts and motives and our outward actions. And frankly, the human race is enslaved to its sinful rebellion against its maker. And all of us are infected by this. You got this infection from your parents, and you can tell them I said so. And they got it from theirs, and they got it from theirs, all the way back to the first man and woman in the Garden of Eden. And ever since mankind fell into sinful rebellion against God, the world's been broken and corrupt, and we're all guilty. You say, what's good news about that? Well, actually, that's just the first half of it. That's like when the doctor says, you have this disease. doesn't sound like good news to me. And then the doctor says, but I have this cure, and it's an infallible cure. Here's here's the good news part of the good news. God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was 100% God, and he became 100% man also. You think that makes 200%? Yep, something like that. And he lived on the earth, and he never sinned, and he died on a cross. And he wasn't a victim. He died on the cross on purpose, So that he could be the sin bearer for everyone who would believe in him. And he went to the cross. And he bore our sin before the holy justice of his father. And he paid for sin. So that every sin you have ever committed, past, present, and future, if you believe in Jesus Christ, is completely, once and for all time, forgiven and washed away. So there is no condemnation left for anyone who belonged to Christ. Not only did he go to the cross and pay for our sins there, but he also rose from the dead, which proved that that payment was accepted and conquered death for everyone who belongs to him. That's what we mean by gospel or good news, that Jesus died in the place of sinners to bring us to God, what you were made for, to belong to him, to delight in him, to be in his presence and not be incinerated, but actually enjoy his glory, is made possible, made actual by the death of Jesus Christ in our place. This gospel has to get to every nation. Everybody needs to hear this. It's the only way to get saved. It's the only way to escape eternal hell. It is the only way to be right with God. And so if people in Gilbert, Arizona, or in the mountains of Papua New Guinea are going to believe this, they must hear it. How will they hear it? Jesus commissioned 11 guys to make disciples who would make disciples 
who would make disciples, who would make disciples all the way down to our day. Followers of followers of followers of Jesus. Who would hear the gospel, believe the gospel, know the gospel, be baptized as a public testimony of belief in the gospel, and then keep everything Jesus commanded, which includes Jesus' blueprint for taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, which is the church unfolded in the rest of the New Testament. Why must there be pastors? Because part of Jesus' blueprint was the establishing of qualified leaders who will shepherd God's people with God's word. The English word pastor is just the Latin word pastor, which means shepherd. It's an interesting metaphor when you think about a a Middle Eastern shepherd caring for a flock of sheep with the tasks of leading and feeding and protecting from ravenous animals. It is the task of shepherds or pastors in local churches to open God's word so that we, God's people, can feed. It is the task of shepherds in local churches to protect God's people from bad doctrine and bad teachers. It is the task of shepherds in the local church to give care to souls, personal, intimate care. This culture of discipleship that Jesus commends here has to be part of the whole church. To to make disciples isn't just make more apostles. Don't just replicate church leadership, but make disciples of all the nations. That is, followers of Jesus need to be taught to observe all that Jesus commands. What is a culture of discipleship in a local church? It means all of us together opening God's word and following Jesus. Following Jesus together. The the, the ministry in a local church is not the job of the leadership. The ministry in the local church is the job of all of us together. And so a culture of normalized, organic discipleship means it's just the expectation that as you're following Jesus, there are people you look to who are a couple steps ahead of you that you say, I want to follow them to the degree that they're following Jesus. And it means that there are people in your wake who are watching your life, who are saying, I want to follow him as he follows Jesus. Discipleship ought to be the normal culture in the church. You ought to always have somebody that you're looking up to and somebody that you're pulling along. You can be one day old in the Lord and find somebody else who doesn't know as much as you that needs to follow Jesus. And you never outgrow the need to be looking to others for help in your walk with Christ. Discipleship ought to be the normal, organic culture of the church. We're just in each other's lives, helping each other follow Christ better. And discipleship is also to be intentional. It should be just happening all the time in our relationships. And there are things we do to cultivate a program of intentional and systematic discipleship. I have for you up on the screen a a chart, sort of a flow chart of the discipleship of men at the church. And, And you can't see this. Um, You just sort of get the visual, but there's a a big bubble at the bottom, and and that is the men who are members and regular attenders. That's all the men in this room, all the men who just come to Grace Bible Church normally. And, And you hear the preaching of God's word, we sing God's praises together, but we want all the men in the church to be a part of a an intentional, systematic discipleship called Build. Uh, It has just started. Many of you men are in it now. Uh, Most of you have been through it before. And and the task of BUILD is to help disciple all the men in this church with the fundamental disciplines of what it means to walk with Jesus. These are things we never get past. These are things we never graduate from. But we're learning there to cultivate godly character. We learn there to read God's word regularly, not to win arguments, not to check up a box, so I'm supposed to read my Bible, but actually to meet with God and hear from him. We learn to love and serve and lead in our homes, in the contexts of our closest relationships. 
We learn not to leapfrog over our character, over our heart. We learn not to play leapfrog over our homes. We learn to seek the Lord. And for that, seeking the Lord and taking care of our hearts to flow out into all of life. That's what all the men in this church should be doing. And so uh, the, the leadership of this church has sought out intentional ways to cultivate that. Up that flow chart is how men get to be from, hey, I'm sitting here to I'm a pastor at Grace Bible Church or I'm sent out as a missionary. Not everybody ends up being a pastor at Grace Bible Church. Not everybody ends up sent to Papua New Guinea. You don't have to do those things to be godly. To be a faithful Christ follower means being a, a godly man a godly husband, a godly father, whatever the context that the Lord has for you, and serving in the church as an active participant, using your gifts as the Lord has given. But some men will pursue leadership in the church, a kind of servant leadership that lays its life down for the benefit of others. And, and what's required for that kind of leadership is that a man watch his life and his doctrine closely, so as you move sort of up the scale on this intentional discipleship program for the men at Grace Bible Church, uh, there is a, a narrower and narrower focus for the training of some skills and some information, theological precision. And how do we get theological precision? We study hermeneutics and homiletics and we learn a bunch of big words. Guys are learning how to handle God's word accurately so they can care for God's people. And we begin to see as leaders, whom is God raising up to plant a church, to translate the Bible in a far off place, to serve as a pastor elder here at Grace Bible Church? Who is God raising up as a deacon layer of servant leadership in the church? Who is God going to raise up to be a small group leader or a build discussion group leader? Who is God going to train here for a little while and send away to serve other churches? to pass the baton and do similar things. Next slide shows a similar blueprint for the discipleship of women in the church based on Titus 2. Older women are to teach younger women. And if you're in Wellspring, uh, you're, you're getting a, a heavy dose of that now. And, and the idea is similar. Godly women are, are looking behind them and saying, who can I bring along to greater faithfulness in Christ? Who can I help with godly character and instruction in God's word in the various spheres that the women are in? And so all of this is critical, uh, not only a, an organic sort of normalized discipleship just happens kind of culture, but also intentional and, and programmatic and systematic. Where do shepherds come from? Uh, shepherds come from the normal discipleship and training of men inside the local church. That's where they come from, just discipleship. Secondly, where do shepherds come from? They come from pastors imparting the sacred trust to reliable men. And I want you to turn to our second passage this morning. It's 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. 2 Timothy is, is part of three letters in the New Testament we call the pastoral letters. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy, and he said, I'm writing these things to you, and I think it includes 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. I'm writing these things to you so that you will know how to do church. That's a paraphrase. These are an instruction manual for church, and, and so 2 Timothy 2.2 2 comes out of this instruction manual. Follow along as I read it. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses... And trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Where do shepherds come from? They come from pastors imparting the sacred trust to reliable men. I want you to imagine for a moment Timothy and the other elders with him at the church at Ephesus in the first century, laboring in pastoral ministry, preaching, counseling, caring for widows, mending marriages, helping parents, teaching in various contexts, battling false teachers, battling false teaching. How in the world will they have time to train another generation of pastors? They're swamped. What if they had been so swamped that they didn't pass the baton? Where would we be today? What would have happened? 
The church would die in a generation. One of the tasks of pastoral ministry is laid out for us here in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Of all the things a pastor must do, one of those things is replication. The pastor needs to replicate himself. Leadership development is the long, hard, slow process that we must hurry up and do. Short-sighted and long-sighted philosophy of ministry compete with one another. There is always the tyranny of the urgent. What do I need to do this week? And what do I need to do this week? Crowds out what I must be doing in the long term very easily. And so a church has to set its sights on what happens when this generation of elders and pastors at Grace Bible Church dies. And I didn't mean to look at you, Denny, even though you're closer than the others. I just glanced over there. I'm sorry. This is a serious obligation for us. We can't be so absorbed in the immediacy of pastoral ministry that we're not intentionally training another generation of men to take our place. So there are two parts to this um, imparting the sacred trust to reliable men. Let's talk first about the sacred trust. Look at 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these. There is a sacred trust. It, it is a, a body of truth. It is a body of doctrine. Paul describes this in 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, as the standard of sound words that you heard from me. And then he says, guard through the Holy Spirit, the treasure that has been entrusted to you. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul describes it this way, not as the words of men, but what it really is, the word of God. What does he mean by these things, what you've heard from me? That this is apostolic doctrine. In other words, it's the, it's the body of truth that Jesus gave to that first generation of men called the apostles. The truths that you heard from Paul. Paul often uses this verb heard to describe specifically the body of truth that Jesus gave to the apostles to be given to the church age. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, he calls this the traditions which he taught. In 1 Corinthians 14.37, he calls it the commands to all the churches, the practices commended to all the churches, excuse me. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.27, he calls it the instructions he gave in the letters that would be read to all the churches. In other words, this is the New Testament. From the Great Commission, teach them to observe all that I command. It's the New Testament. This body of doctrine given to the apostles. It's what we have written for us in Matthew through Revelation. It is the truth of God's word. That's not to negate the Old Testament. It is to look at the instructions given specifically to the church through the New Testament. What's interesting about 2 Timothy 2.2, it is an implicit denial of apostolic succession. You may have heard of apostolic succession. You know, the apostles had people that were apostles after them, and, and we have apostles today. There are some church traditions that believe in modern apostles the Catholic Church would say that Peter was the first pope, and there's always been a pope in papal succession. Uh, this verse goes against that. In fact, he tells Timothy, who's not an apostle, to take the things the apostles had and pass it on to others who will be able to teach others also. He does not pass on the gift of apostleship or the office of apostleship. In fact, the New Testament makes it clear those were foundational offices not to be repeated. And when you build a 20-story building, you don't keep building the foundation. It happens at the bottom and everything else is built on top of it. That's Ephesians 2.20. What was uh, Paul also denying? Not just apostolic secession, but also ongoing revelation. He doesn't tell Timothy, wait until Jesus tells you some more stuff, Timothy. No, he says, actually, what you heard from me, what I received from Jesus... You tell those things to men who will be able to teach others. Timothy's task was not to carry on the torch of apostolic ministry, 
nor to carry on the, the, the looking for ongoing revelation. No, in fact, the church would be dependent upon the entrusting of those truths to faithful men who won't change them, who won't take away from them, who will not add to them, but simply herald them faithfully throughout the church age. What does it mean to train leaders? It means the church can't go out and hire another apostle Paul. The church can't install a new line of prophets to speak truth by direct revelation. No, each successive generation of the church must train others to faithfully teach the truths given in that first generation. And when Paul says in verse 2, you heard these things from me in the presence of many witnesses, he just means it wasn't secret knowledge off there somewhere in, in, in some dark space that only, only really uh, in tune guys knew about. No, this was widely known. Everybody knew what Paul taught. They could testify that, that they had all heard these things from Paul. And this is in contrast to the people at Ephesus where this letter was written to that, that believed that their myths and legends uh, were known by a secret society. And you had to get in with the gurus to know it. No, this is published broadcast truth. What does it mean to entrust them? This word for entrusting is a word that means to give for safekeeping. In Acts 20, 32, Paul entrusted the Ephesian elders to the Lord. In 1 Peter 4, 19, believers who are suffering entrust their souls to God who is faithful. It's a giving of something in a lockbox of security for safekeeping. This is the instruction Paul gives to Timothy. He says, Timothy, guard these things you've been entrusted with. 1 Timothy 6. And here in 2 Timothy 2, entrust these things to faithful men. So the truth must be imparted to reliable men. We've looked at the sacred trust. Now let's look at what it means to entrust this to faithful men. Look at the last part of verse 2. Entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This precious body of truth to be given for safekeeping is also to be given for transmission, not merely locked away, but given as a, as a safety deposit to be given away. And who must have this task? Reliable men, faithful men, trustworthy men who can hold on to and pass on God's truth. To be faithful here just simply means to be worthy of belief or trust. To be trustworthy, dependable, reliable. And notice the word order here. And trust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In other words, you have to find faithful men and entrust the doctrine of the New Testament to them. Listen, sometimes we get this just a little bit backwards in the church. Any man with a pulse... Sometimes we feel like, oh man, he's got a lot of energy. He's really excited about Jesus. Give him a bunch of doctrine and let him go lead stuff. That is not the New Testament pattern. There's a very real danger in handing a new believer Charnock's existence and attributes of God. You know, this old dusty book that's that thick with a bunch of big words. Just give it to that guy and let him run. And... And a young man, naturally given to pride, perhaps astounded at how everybody's amazed at his excitement for Jesus all of a sudden, now has a, a bunch of big ideas and a bunch of big words to inflate his head and beat people up with. It is such a regular occurrence that the New Testament warns against it. First Timothy 5 says, do not lay your hands on anyone, meaning don't ordain, don't set apart men for ministry too quickly or you will share in their sins. Listen, bad men make good doctrine look bad. Every Christian needs theology. Every follower of Jesus is a theologian. 
But what we're talking here about entrusting truth to faithful men. We mean there's a danger in giving immature men theological categories and vocabulary and, and head knowledge that they'll bludgeon people with. Some guys believe that a theological conversation or a library of information equals spiritual maturity. When in reality, an, an immature man can hide behind the theological speak. And it makes him untouchable and unteachable. I have seen older, wiser, godly men intimidated by the theological conversations of men with unbridled tongues, unrepentant sin patterns, and unrecognized arrogance. And, and these old faithful guys who have walked with Jesus for 35 years but don't have all the college words get shamed by the young guy who just learned one of those big words and beaten up the old guy and doesn't know how to learn from him. So you be very careful with this. One pastor wisely noted, your theology will not always move you in the direction of obedience because your theology is governed by the condition of your heart. That is a critical piece for us to understand. This is why Paul says, entrust these things to faithful men. Find faithful men and entrust these things to them so that they'll be able to teach others. Don't make everybody a teacher. Let not many of you become teachers, my brothers. You incur a stricter judgment, James 3.1. But find faithful men and entrust them with the truth so they'll be able to teach others also. A man who is playing leapfrog over his heart or over his home or over his character is not a good candidate to handle God's word in people's lives. How do we balance this? We, we need leaders in the church now. And leadership development is a long, slow, hard process. So hurry up and start and keep doing it. It's better to go slow and build quality leadership than to rush the process and destroy lives. How do you know if a man's faithful, the kind of man who could be trusted to persevere and then to promulgate God's precious truth? Look at what he does with what he receives. Is he teachable? Is he humbled by what he learns? Paul said the goal of our instruction, 1 Timothy 1.5, is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Does it produce love in his life, love for God, love for others? Is there an increasing knowledge that puffs up his pride or, or does he exercise wisdom in the application of truth to life? Do the great and glorious truths of God humble him or are they merely stimulation for his intellectual curiosity? Is he a man who confesses shortcomings as they are revealed by the word of God? Or does he learn to avoid those truths that assault his sin and dwell only on the ideas that he can wield over others? Is a man given to pride, avarice, self-serving ambition, or a love of power? Does a man view doctrine as a toy to be played with, engaging in theological argumentation just for the sport of it? Or does he see it as a precious treasure to be prized and passed on? If you read the New Testament, particularly the letters, you will discover a relationship between doctrine and character. Paul tells elders to watch your life and your doctrine closely. And there's a relationship between those. You see someone's doctrine go awry, you can almost guarantee that there is a life awry behind the scenes. Sometimes the life goes first and doctrine follows. Sometimes doctrine goes first and paves the way for a bad life but those are usually related to each other. And notice the end of verse two, and trust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You probably played the telephone game where people try to faithfully pass on what they heard. And, and as you play that game, maybe you're in a circle and you're whispering in an ear and, and they whisper what they heard to the next ear and on down the circle. And, and some people just don't understand what was said. And so they pass on a, a garbled message. Some people just don't have a great ability to remember. I know you just told me that like half a second ago, but in the time it took me to turn this way, to turn that way, I have already forgotten. 
Can you tell me again? Some people lack the ability to clearly articulate the message that they did remember. And the message comes out garbled. And then there's always that one guy. And maybe it's you. <laughs> and you know who you are. You're, you're in the circle. You hear the message and you're like, I want to see this come out funny at the end. And so you intentionally change it. Listen, th- there is a, a critical relay race that we are running in the church era until Jesus returns. And that is to take the baton and not drop it, not alter it, not change it, not mess up the message, but faithfully pass it on to another generation who will be able to pass it on again. And notice in verse 2, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Able to teach means meeting the standard of the ability required so we're not, we're not looking for superstar orators. We're not going to fall down the trap that Paul identified in 1 Corinthians of, of looking for the people that can wow a crowd with their oratorical ability. We're looking for ability to teach, to accurately handle God's word and bring it into the lives of God's people. Competent, qualified. And notice the verb tense in verse 2. These faithful men will be able to teach others also. There's a forward look to this. In fact, there are four generations in view in this verse. Paul, Timothy, faithful men, and others who will be able to teach. John MacArthur has said that Timothy is the second runner in a long relay in this verse. Notice that Paul is not telling Timothy to hand over the reins of power but to find men of good character who will be able to teach others the truth. How do you identify faithful men? Where do you find them? Amazon.com? Is there a store? The church has to train them. We got to share the gospel with people. Whom will God save? And then from the pool of people that God saves... Uh, we'll disciple everybody. And who rises to the surface with a desire for the hard work of shepherding ministry? Who rises to the surface with a character required for it? And who rises to the surface with a competency that it demands? Now, we, we inherit shepherds from other churches who have faithfully done this at times. And and, and we want to pay that forward. How, how do we train men here and send them out so other churches benefit from the investment? But this is the task of the church. It's part of pastoral responsibility. It's the way the elders of this church view their pastoral responsibility. Discipling men, training men, equipping men to be able to hand the baton. It does mean that After we've invested in men and handed a baton, they will run. And some of them run away from here. That's sad and good. We pray that they will run faithfully gripping that baton of truth unaltered. As workmen unashamed with lives unstained. That's our goal. So what is the expositor's seminary? The Expositor's Seminary is 12 churches that think this way. Holding hands, working together to train the next generation of shepherds. You've got locations up there on the screen. You you can see the banner in the front lobby and, and you can see those locations. Those are all churches. Those aren't classrooms sitting somewhere in, in a building in the middle of a city. Those are classrooms in the petri dish of the life of a local church. Shepherded by godly men who are doing the thing we've just been talking about. And what's great about this network of churches is we get to share this load together. Now this church was committed to training men for ministry before we were a part of Expositor Seminary, but it meant that the elders had to carry the load of all the disciplines required for faithful ministry. And joining our churches together means that we get to serve one another in specific ways. 
I get to specialize in some things. And the other pastors are specializing in some things. And we get to train men in a really unique way together. We were doing Zoom before it was cool. But Zoom hasn't been around a long time. I want you to think about what it's like in a small town as a pastor. Maybe the pastor leads the music and folds the bulletins and locks and unlocks the church doors and runs the vacuum cleaner and does the premarital counseling and postmarital counseling and marries and buries and preaches week in and week out and teaches the adult Sunday school. How in the world can a man like that train a pastor with whatever he can do? Because discipleship is part of pastoral ministry. He's training men. And, and sometimes a man gets so far and you think, I don't have what it takes or the time to teach church history and you need church history to teach systematics and, and, and you need systematic theology and to teach Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. So a guy can do firsthand exegesis in the original languages. I, I don't have time. How do I do that? And you think about faithful pastors around the world that are doing everything they can with this heartbeat to get men as far as they can get them. And there's a time and a place where a man has to be sent off to seminary. And you pray that it's a seminary that thinks like a local church. And praise God, I went to a seminary like that. And in God's kind providence, we get to do something really unique with the robust academics, uh, with the men that God has assembled in this network to not have to send our Josh Kelsos and our Omri Miles away, but to train them right here. It is a gift of God's kindness. Let me tell you about the heart of the Expositor Seminary. It is, it is located in a class that, that most of the guys take their first semester called Apologetical Methodology. Bunch of big words. It's, it's Dr. Zemek's baby. And, and what it is essentially is believing the doctrines of grace as your roadmap for methodology. What do I mean by that? Man's plight is really bad. Man's a sinner. And only God's sovereign grace can remedy that situation. Centered in the cross work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit to draw someone to faith in Christ unto a security in Christ. And, and I just outlined five points for you and they, they spell a certain flower if you want them to. But if you believe that God is sovereign and is the only solution to man's impossible problems, you believe the, the gospel is the only way that people get saved and the sovereign work of God by his Holy Spirit is the only way people believe, then do you know what that does for the way you do church? You get rid of all the gimmicks. And the pragmatic approach, like a used car salesman that tries to say, what techniques do I need to use to get you into this car today? We don't have the power to make somebody believe the gospel. We just have the responsibility of proclamation. And when it comes to people being discipled and growing in Christ, we trust God's blueprint. We just speak God's truth from the word of God and watch his spirit do work through the word. And we labor in that. But it is his work done his way. Uh, for 50 years, that is the message that Dr. Zemek gave to churches and to seminary students and to already several generations of pastors. And that is a work we want to continue. It's the heartbeat of the Expositor Seminary. If I could use another physiological metaphor, what is the spinal column of the Expositor Seminary? Uh, the spinal column is what we would call an exegetical methodology. There's a bunch of big words right there. What I mean by that is how will we do theology? How will we do preaching? How will we do counseling? How will we do missions from the word, from the word of God? Dr. Zemek's doctoral dissertation has just been reprinted into book form. 
And it's called tethered to the text. And, and it gets at what he haunted us at the conscience level with how we must do what we do. Preaching is to be exegetical. That just means I have to get the meaning out of the Bible. I'm not putting my meaning into the Bible. What is the task of the preacher? To, to tell you what the Bible says and apply it to your life. Not to make up stuff. And not to come with my own ideas and try to buy, find a Bible verse to prove it, but to actually say what the word says. That's exegesis or getting the meaning out of the text. And so it means that if a man is going to give his life to studying God's word, to bring it into the lives of God's people for a lifetime, what must he do? He needs to know his Bible. And you, you may know that your Bible was not written in English. It wasn't even written in King's English. It was written in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And, and if you're going to spend your life studying the Bible and proclaiming God's word, you've got to get it right. 2 Timothy 4, 2, you've got to cut it straight. How will you do that? You, you're going to have to learn the languages. That's not to say that English only preaching is bad. It just means if you're going to devote yourself to a lifetime of this ministry, in good conscience, you have these things available to you. You need to study the languages. It, it's why our guys spend four years, and some of them are, are compressing a four-year study into six, eight, or ten years. But they're going to learn the original languages. They're going to learn how to use them. They're, they're, they're going to be constructing sermons and counseling and a philosophy of ministry and missions and systematic theology out of the text. Not putting those things into the text. This is hard work. And I'm getting at where you come in. You need to pray for our seminary students. They are laboring. They are sweating. They are missing sleep. They have lives and jobs and families. They've got wives and kids. Responsibilities in the church. And they are going through the grinder. I have them listed for you here on the screen. You can probably have to skip one slide to get there. These are our current students. Two of our current students are pastors, elders at the church. You see there's Scott Demarest and Ben James. Uh, ben James is um, an auditor, but auditor sounds like you, you fly on the wall, sit and listen to classes. We do have auditors that do that, but, but Ben's sort of auditor plus. He does all the reading assignments. He writes the papers and turns them in, and I grade them. <laughs> he, is, he is in the throes of it. Um, also in seminary here at Grace Bible Church, Jackson Kennedy, David Britton, Jeremy Lehman, Alex DeShields, Chris Drent. And you see their families up there with them because their, their families are co-laborers. They are co-sufferers. They're enduring the throes of this thing too. And then there are three men that are in seminary currently that are serving other churches in the East Valley. Daniel Bruce, he is at Shepherd's House. Nate Rosales, who is at Mission Bible Church Gilbert. And Tyler Azeltine, who is at Gilbert Bible Church. And um, they are going through it. You need to pray for them. Their pictures, by the way, are out in the lobby. So you can stop by, get their names and faces, make them part of your regular prayer. Uh, what is the role of the current elders, our pastors here, who have been discipled and are discipling men in this church? Uh, the task of the elders of this church is to train more. Keep leading build and the trust and the various discipleship programs. And we will see whom God puts a desire in the heart and character in the life that we can then equip with tools for this task of shepherding, missions, Bible translation, church planting. And what is your responsibility? Your responsibility is to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, being discipled, cultivating the same heart disciplines, Reading the same Bible, growing to be more like Christ, serving one another, functioning as a healthy body of believers. Do you know what a, a pastor in training needs to see? A church that's operating on all cylinders. 
And it just means to the degree that we are mature as a body, to the degree that we love one another and, and practice all those one another commands and, and are in each other's lives in a culture of discipleship, to a degree that a church is following a biblical philosophy of ministry. To that degree, a pastor sees the blueprint for what do I need to do when I get out there someday? What do I need to aim at? And this church's responsibility is, is to invest in those who are training. Listen, there's some growing pains in that. You might be in a small group and a seminoid is leading a small group discussion a core questions discussion, preaching a sermon that's an assignment from class. He's got to try it out on real people. And you're like the victims. <laughs> what is your job? Be patient, give encouragement, give helpful correction. Listen, you've been walking with Jesus for three, four, five, six decades. Speak into that young man's life. Be bold. Love, invite them into your homes Feed them meals. They are eager to bend over backwards to serve you. And you've felt that already. And be eager to bend over backwards and serve them. Again, if you'd like to give towards the books and the tuition for our students here on this campus as they go through seminary, you can do that by designating a gift and giving that to the church anytime. And if you'd like to give to the ministry of the Expositors Seminary, Play golf in the spring. Talk to Nick O'Neill about how to do that. Um, or you can give. And you can give with the QR code on this screen. Um, or really any time of the year, you can just write something into the office and say, hey, I'd like to give to the Expositor Seminary as a whole. Uh, and your gifts will go towards that. I'm so thankful for this church and for its passion for training men. I think back to days in, for me, it was... 16 years ago that Janet and I came here and this church was already about the business of training men, of discipling men. And it was when Josh Kelso said, guys, I've been, I've been wanting to be aiming at pastoral ministry for the last eight years. I can't shake the desire. I've taken everything there is to take here. I'm going to go to masters. I want to go to seminary. And the elders of this church said, we can't lose Josh. And if Josh goes out to California, we've been there, we know he's going to be the third string chair stacker in a Bible study while he's learning ministry. If he stays here, he's a deacon, he's got a shepherd's heart, he's involved in every ministry in the church, and he was also our music leader at the time. Like, we, we can't lose this guy. But how could we ask him to stay and miss out on everything that Master Seminary would, would have to offer? which was great. There, there's no other place we could have sent a guy at the time. And the elders said, no, we're, we're committed. We, we think we can do this. We, we think we can take a stab at Greek and Hebrew and church history and systematic theology. And, and the elders of this church have sacrificed significantly to that end. And we want to keep doing that. And, and you church are just a massive part of that. So I want to thank you on behalf of our students um, and generations, we pray, that will benefit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to reflect on men who have invested in us, the men and women who have discipled and made a discipleship culture in this church. We know that they benefited from the lives of others before them. And we pray that, that we would not be the end of the race, but we would pass these things on to others. God, we pray for the students who are in seminary right now, that you would give them endurance, uh, that you would give them hearts filled with love for you, that they would not get lost in academia, but they would lose themselves in love for you and service to your church, that these things would be real and down to earth and practical. And we pray that as they face the challenges that they will go through, that you would be near to them and be their help. We pray for this church that it would remain faithful for all of its existence and many generations even beyond us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.